Did you know a Turkish Cypriot family ruled South London's underworld in the 80s? The Arifs weren't just any family. They stepped into a gap left by the infamous Richardsons and Cray twins, and for 50 years, they built an untouchable empire. Their quiet rise to power made them a hidden yet formidable force in London's criminal landscape. You might be wondering, how did they manage to stay at the top for so long? I've dug deep into their story to find out. This saga is laced with cunning, ruthlessness, and connections. You'll see how their empire, which troubled the police and public alike, was built and maintained. But there's more. I'll take you behind the scenes of their audacious operations, show you their surprising reach into places like football clubs, and finally reveal the dramatic downfall that ended their reign. The story of the Air Rifts is not just about crime, it's a tale of power, ambition, and a fall from grace. So stay with me as we delve into the secrets hidden in the shadows of South London's past. Who filled the power vacuum in London's underworld? Ever wondered who filled the ominous power vacuum in London's tumultuous underworld after the Cray twins? Enter the story of the Arifs, a Turkish Cypriot crime family who settled in London's Rotherhithe and Old Kent Road in the 1950s. Up till the 1960s, the Cray twins, named Ronnie and Reggie Cray, had controlled the shadowy streets of South London. However, the sun was about to set on their relatively uncontested rule, as they met their downfall in the late 1960s with their arrest. A void was created with their arrests, which was to be filled by multiple crime organizations. One of them was the Arifs, a Turkish Cypriot crime family who had settled in London's Rotherhithe and Old Kent Road in the 1950s. Stepping into the shadows left by the Cray twins, the Arifs, alongside the infamous Clerkenwell Crime Syndicate and the Brindle family, began to rewrite the rules of London's underworld. What kind of terror did the Arifs unleash on London's streets? In the late 1960s, the Arifs began their notorious reign, casting a shadow of fear through the dark alleys of London's underworld. Then came the 1990s when another powerful group, the Richardsons, that dominated the Old Kent Road, collapsed. With the incarceration of the feared crime boss Eddie Richardson in the 1990s, a new era dawned in South London, one where the Arifs reigned supreme. Bermondsey, which is the heart of South London's underworld, became their turf. Now there was no stopping the proliferating hold of the Arifs. As is a dark yet necessary element of the underworld, the turf wars were bound to come with multiple groups striving to fill the void. That happened soon and the Arifs would engage in a highly publicized gang war during the 1990s with Clerkenwell and Brindle crime groups. However, the gang war didn't impact their criminal activities. The Arifs' reach wasn't confined to the shadows. It extended into the daylight through ownership of a football club, pubs, restaurants, and nightclubs across Southward. But the highlights of their rising empire were still their criminal activities. Led by four brothers Bakir, Dogen Mehmet, and Dennis, the gang engaged in far-reaching violent robberies, international arms deals, drug trafficking, and many other racketeering-related activities. Dennis and Mehmet carved out a reputation as serious armed robbers in the 1980s. They would hit Securicor vans across the southeast of England. Their brazen armed robberies netted them millions and drew the unwavering focus of Scotland Yard leading to the formation of a special task force in the 1980s with the sole aim of dismantling their growing empire. Their notoriety soon earned them a title of Britain's number one crime family. Their name was taken with the infamous gangland names like the Crays, Richardsons, and the Frasers. In a world teeming with rival gangs, what gave the Air Rifts an edge? Their dominance wasn't just brute force, it was also their strategic alliances. Their Turkish connection provided them access to Class A narcotics, which the other gangs could only dream of. Since the 1980s, the Turkish networks have dominated the multi-million pound drugs trade in the United Kingdom, establishing themselves as major players in the narcotic landscape. They controlled the route from the poppy fields of Afghanistan to the shadowy streets of Western Europe. Their power base in the narcotics underworld was fortified by colluding with politicians, police officers, and even the Turkish army, making their operation almost invincible. What's more, their enterprise was highly cohesive because they controlled things very tightly. They are hard to penetrate because of their cohesion and indecipherable local dialects. Back in those days, it was near to impossible to penetrate their networks by implanting undercover officers, 
tapping their phones, or installing bugs. Their influence rivaled that of the Colombian cartels and the Italian Camorra or Mafia. Yet they maintained a cloak of mystery, with little known about their inner workings. As we reflect on the tumultuous history of the Arifs, one might wonder how their influence has endured to the present day. Despite the passage of years and numerous shifts in the criminal landscape, one aspect remains unchanged. Obscurity remains to this day, and that's precisely how they like it. However, it's known that their allies, such as the Arifs, gained a significant edge over their competitors through these powerful connections. Additionally, the Arifs benefited from the use of local dialects. Their skill in communicating in their native tongue, coupled with a unique mixed-up accent, made it challenging for law enforcement to intercept and decode their communications. The Arif Brothers, a legacy of infamy and power. By the early 1980s, Dogen Arif's audacity had captured global attention with his arrest for orchestrating a brazen plot to kidnap Iranian diplomats a scheme that reverberated throughout the international community. The conspirators also intended to scam the Iranian government in an arms deal. They were planning to provide 8,000 missiles that didn't exist and charge the government a staggering amount of 26 million euros for them. Notably, Iran was facing an international arms embargo, and a few entities in the underworld decided to leverage the situation. This time period was the beginning of the Iran-Contra affair, where several high-level officials in the Reagan administration facilitated illegal arms sales to Iran. So, the time was ripe to pull a shenanigan like that. However, the kidnapping plot and the fictitious missile scheme was busted when armed police raided two flats near Marble Arch in central London. While the conspirators received hefty prison terms, Dogen Arif was acquitted of the conspiracy to imprison. But his intriguing association with the international plot only enriched the family's sinister mystique. Yet, Dogen Arif's life was not confined to the clandestine corridors of crime. He also ventured into the public eye through more legitimate endeavors. Beyond the shadowy world of crime, Dogen Arif also made a significant name for himself in more legitimate circles, revealing the complex layers of his influence. He became the manager of Fisher Athletic FC, a semi-professional club in Southeast London in the late 70s, playing a pivotal role in elevating the club from obscurity to fame in the late 1980s. As an owner of jewelers, a nightclub, and a restaurant, he invested a fortune into the club. While speaking to the Times in 1988, he said that it was his dream to witness the club promoted from the conference into the football league. It nearly made it into the fourth division under Arif's patronage. In 1990, he was convicted of drug offenses at Maidstone Crown Court. Allegedly, he was linked to a smuggling operation of 2.5 tons of cannabis shipment. Now, in the gangland, the more one distances them from one's operations, lesser are the chances of them getting caught. But for Arifs, this wasn't an option. Just like any old-fashioned gang, it was a matter of honor for them to engage in gangland battles just for the sake of it. That would tell others on the streets who was in charge. With this approach, it wasn't any surprise that they came on the police's radar who didn't want another powerful crime family taking roots in South London. In a bid to quell the new miscreants, a special squad was formed just to target the Arifs. However, the Arifs were the kings of their turfs. Even when they got nicked, it was only a matter of time before they walked free again. Their connections extended across the London gangland. This was evident in a family wedding in 1990, where the guest list was, who is who, of London crime. Members of all the notorious groups, such as the Coleman, Frasers, White and Hiscock families, attended the West End festivities. Along with the well-established connections, the wedding also boasted the crime family's opulence. The reception occurred at the Savoy and reportedly accrued a hefty tab of 32,000 euros in bar bill. You should know that Dogen was not the only brother with towering notoriety. Dennis and Mamet came under the limelight in November 1990 in yet another armed robbery which had gone awry. This robbery also highlighted the fact that, regardless of how much some of the gang members like to portray a playboy image of themselves, they were an extremely brutal crew. What happened then was that the brother duo planned the heist where the plan was to steal a secure corps van containing 1 million euros in Woodhatch, Surrey. The heavily armed crew acted when the van driver stopped for a coffee near Rygate. The plan was to take hold of the van, drive it to a secure location, and then filch the cash. 
The crew included four men who were armed with sophisticated weapons. The types of these weapons tell a lot about the crime group's reach. The crew was wearing weird masks, such as that of Ronald Reagan, and body armor. Despite all the preparation, the entire plan came crashing down when the armed police stormed at the scene. One of the crew members was a renowned London villain, Kenny Baker, who was told to freeze by the police. However, Baker decided not to oblige and swung a gun towards officers. It was a very miscalculated move, as he was shot dead right there. The incident proved to be the end of the two brothers' criminal careers. Dennis received 22 years and Mehmet got 18 years of prison term. The other crew member, Anthony Downer, who was also a Reef's brother-in-law, was also caught and incarcerated for 18 years. The Arif's influence was so well established that the prosecutors recommended providing the jury proper protection. They stated that the Arif family or associates would attempt to interfere one way or another with the jury. They have done it before and are quite capable of doing it again. While handing out their sentence, Judge Heather Steele said to the brothers, you are each dangerous, ruthless, greedy, and clever men from whom society must be protected for a very long time. The brothers were sent to H.M. Prison Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight. Even in prison, they were believed to exert considerable influence and kept running their operations outside prison. Now we come to the fourth brother. Although more brothers were involved in the enterprise, four of them remained in the spotlight. The fourth brother, Bikir Arif, was known as the Duke on the streets. This brother has an even diverse portfolio and rap sheet. His convictions would begin from 1977 when was caught in an armed robbery that resulted in the death of a security guard. The incident has been explained in Wensley Clarkson's thrilling account of the gangland in his book, Gangsters. According to this book, the robbery was like a scene from a thriller movie. Showing weapons, a group of thugs forced the security van off the road in broad daylight. The vehicle came to a halt instantly and the crew opened fire on the security guards. One of them was hit point-blank and died later. This robbery sealed the group's notorious reputation and sent a message that they were not to be trifled. They managed to rake in today's one million pounds from that robbery. However, the cops caught them later. Bakir got five years for robbery, stealing cars, possessing guns without certificates and disposing of them. But the appalling part of this thrilling saga is another Arif brother's charges and the outcome of his trial. Ozer Arif, who was a minicab boss from Southwark at that time, was charged with murder. And after a four-week trial, he was set free. Interestingly, the police announced after the incident that they had broken the backs of the Arifs. They had no idea how wrong they were at that time. Bikir posed as a second-hand car dealer before the world, but his dealership was a front for narcotic money. Just like his brothers, he was well known to the police for his nefarious activities. In 1999, he was convicted of smuggling 100 key dollars of drugs worth a striking $12.5 million. He was jailed for 23 years for the crime. At that time, he was one of the UK's wealthiest crooks with net worth amounting to millions of pounds. Nevertheless, the mention of this incident appears in Guy Stanton's accounts of his life. Before we delve into the details of this mention, let's explore the incredible tale of Guy Stanton, a covert customs officer in London who posed as a smuggler himself. The man worked for a special unit called Beta Project, which was formed by HM Customs and Excise to infiltrate gangs dealing with narcotics. Stanton spied on these gangs and cartel bosses and facilitated various raids and interceptions. He adopted his cover so effectively that he was known as Mr. Big in Gangland because of his style and personality. However, after having his cover lifted, as he was a witness in several narcotics-related cases, he had to move about in disguise for some time. He received many threats and even attacks. He wrote a book, The Betrayer, to tell the story of his time spent spying on the underworld. In his book, he mentions meeting the Arif family. The family had sent someone to Amsterdam for narcotic supply. Stanton learned about it and passed on the information. The contraband was intercepted in a car and contained seven kgs of drugs. Two more men came along who had two bags with two kilos of smack each. It was a huge risk on Stanton's part, as now Arifs knew there was a snitch amongst them. The author writes that the brother who was known as the roughest of all went berserk when he learned about the seizure, but nobody suspected him. He said that he didn't do much work with the Arifs, as they were already under heavy police scrutiny. Nevertheless, 
Bakir's notoriety didn't stop with this incarceration. He was caught participating in a major counterfeit currency operation in 2011. He was convicted of creating fake coins with a total value of 2,019 euros. He was sent to prison again to serve eight years this time. His incarceration didn't mean a hiatus in the group's criminal activities. He kept running the criminal enterprise from jail. In 2013, Arif was dubbed as one of Britain's most toxic underworld bosses in a rogues gallery of 145 crooks circulated by the Serious Organized Crime Agency. The Arifs were considered so dangerous that they were given special court orders to limit their activities. These orders were otherwise reserved only for terror suspects, especially for Bakir Arif, Judge Recorder Maitland said while passing sentence, his history shows that any attempt to rehabilitate or integrate into an honest life has been met with contempt. His name emerged yet again in 2015 in the crime news in connection to a major caravan narcotic seizure. The police intercepted two caravans present in rural Somerset. The caravans stored large quantities of heroin, amphetamines, and cannabis, which were worth $1.5 million on the street. Bakir was handed a prison term of 11.5 years in 2016 for supply of Class B drugs, while the masterminds of the operation, Richard and Ann Miles, were given 11 and 12 years respectively for the supply of Class A and B drugs. 48 cool wires of amphetamine were present in the caravans, which was 66% pure. The police operation led to multiple arrests across London, Hertfordshire, and Essex. The police were watching over the Somerset branch of the gang for quite some time. The Miles couple had gone to a South London park earlier in 2015 to meet Arif after failing to source narcotics in Liverpool. Arif ordered his associate Manny Carpell from Welland Garden City, Hertfordshire, to meet James Sanderson, the courtier of the couple at a pub where they would load the contraband into a van. The van drove to Pretty in Somerset, where the police swooped and caught them red-handed. What future has in store for them? With lengthy jail sentences handed out to the once powerful brothers, their prospects in the underworld remained uncertain for a long time. According to the police officials, they are busted flush. But that has been said for them plenty of times, and yet they make a comeback. With most of them out of prison now, they do seem quiet. However, According to the crime experts, they are not quiet in the real sense. While the extent of their operations remains unknown today, it hasn't gone all quiet in the real sense. They have invested in a lot of other businesses. At least two of them are based in Northern Cyprus, a place the family originates from. They still have connections and enterprises in Turkey, so they do have some influence. While their comeback may remain a contestable possibility among people, one thing is for sure that they are nowhere near as powerful as they once were. From controlling almost every stretch of South London, they have turned into satellite gangs operating in the streets. With that, we conclude our tale of one of the oldest and most powerful gangs of the British underworld.